when I grew up, uh, I didn't have an interest per se in voices. I just thought of, you know, characters like cartoon characters. I didn't look at the credits. I liked them. I also liked various comedians like Red Skelton, who had his own group of characters on television, um, Jackie Gleason. I liked the idea they owned all those characters. Somehow the ownership appealed to me. I didn't know who Dawes Butler was or Stan Freeberg or June Foray or Paul Fries until I arrived in Los Angeles after studying and becoming an actor. And then I recognized their voices when I did the cartoons with them and I was just floored by how wonderful they were. Those were the first generation of voiceovers and uh, animation people. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came to me in a very unusual way. I was called in to replace a director who had cast himself in the pilot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and given himself four roles. And so I came in to replace him, and they gave me a script for this weird thing called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I thought, well, this is not going to go anywhere. What a stupid title. And then they gave me Krang. And, you know, it said this burbling blob of a villainous character, but funny. And boy, I just kind of threw it all against the wall to see if I could come up with something that fulfilled all the various different descriptions of that character. I also auditioned for Baxter Stockman, Byrne Thompson, and Vernon. And the producer gave me all four, and I said, I can't do all four. I can only do three. And fortunately for the project, Vernon went to Pete Renaday, who did a wonderful job at that character. Vernon! I mean, in the nine years that we recorded together, I think he got more laughs from the cast than anybody. The uh, funny part about Krang was that he was this evil blob, and I also talked backwards like he was getting heartburn from being so angry. And uh, I'd put all that together for the audition, and it also said, but funny. And I thought, how about I do a Jewish mother underneath? Nobody will know, and it'll have a kind of a funny thing like, so this is what I get for surrounding myself with idiots. I think Krang worked very well as he was in partnership with Shredder. And as you recall, James Avery, James Avery did this kind of one note. He was always evil and he was always mad. So that, in combination with Krang, who was all over the place with his expressions and very strange, made a great combination, and we used to refer to them as uh, the odd couple of outer space. When it came to Casey Jones, it was very simple. As most often is the case with inspiration and uh, guidance on characters. It's not complex. It, it's very simple. They wanted Casey Jones, and they said, why don't you do a young Clint Eastwood? So that's where I came up with Casey Jones. Hello, Violator. So I just pitched him up a little bit, and, and that's how we went about it. Most often when we do animation projects, and certainly with the uh, Ninja Turtles, we get um, model sheets. And that really is drawings of the character, usually uh, a couple different angles, but maybe only one. And I remember that I saw Krang and Casey Jones and Baxter Stockman. And that's helpful to many. Frankly, for me, pictures aren't that helpful to me. I don't know why. Um, maybe I'm just not visual. They do help in some cases. For example, when I um, it came to Slash. Slash, Slash is a turtle who's upset all the time. Well, he had he had all these teeth that were kind of splayed out 
in the drawing. So I needed to do something like this. And he was very passionate and upset about things. And I thought, Kirk Douglas, he was always so passionate in everything he did as far as an actor. And so you can hear how I combined those two aspects to create Slash. So in short, pictures help guide imagination. Also descriptions of characters and how they fit into the story and what they fulfill. I knew Baxter Stockman was going to change into a fly before I started doing it. He was a uh, scientist, so I pitched his voice up. And then when he would be a fly, I'd wiggle my throat with my hand. So Baxter Stockman became the fly guy. And all I'm doing is rubbing my, uh, my forefinger and my hand against my throat as I do that. Which is a great trick, especially if you're playing a little character that has to sing. Somewhere over the rainbow. You get a really tight, fast vibrato. And, of course, I'd use that technique <laughs> when he would elongate vowels. Something tells me that you don't know what you're talking about. Exactly. And I would focus on E's or E eh sounds where I could lay that out. I've talked to Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, and uh, they were very encouraging and also uh, very complimentary of Krang. Um, it was one of those good matches where I took all the description elements of the character and tried to lay them out in the sound of his voice as he would progress through various scenes. And uh, I was pleased because it's about the strangest voice I've ever done, and you never know whether a producer's going to like it or not. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the original, was so well cast that there's never been a circumstance where I wish I could have done someone else's role. They were so terrific um, and very much paralleled their own personality. Rob Paulson, he's a smart aleck, so he was perfect for Raphael. Leonardo, some people don't know this, but Cam Clark is my cousin, uh, several times removed, but he was great at Donatello because he had that hero sound to his voice. Townsend was wonderful because he knew about doing this kind of thing because he had kids in high school at the time. And Barry Gordon could have been more perfectly cast as Donatello. He says he's an egghead. He's a smart guy. And while he was doing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, he was also the president of our union, Screen Actors Guild. Also, he went to law school while he was performing on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He'd come in, we'd have our scripts, he'd have his scripts and his law books. I think the Turtles became popular originally because it was fresh, it was off the nose and a little weird, and it was one of the first times that teenagers were presented as they are or we'd like them to be in culture. A lot of times there's a lag time between the writers of projects, who are usually older, and the time of what's current or the style of what's current. I think they hit that. As far as its popularity and how it has uh, maintained, I don't know. I think a great deal of it has to do with nostalgia, which is supported by the fact that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was always about selling toys. And so you hear the, you have these little kids, not only are they watching it, but they're playing with the figures. And I think that combination created a great nostalgia for uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and why it's popular today and why it has become such a, a, a very powerful franchise. Justin, I want to thank you for these wonderful questions that you've given me. 
Um, I do a lot of teaching these days, and I have free lessons at my website for those that are interested in pursuing what I did and what I do. It's patfraley.com. There's a free lesson page. I also have home course studies so I can teach people that are outside the L.A. area and um, also some instructional materials at my bookstore. This is Krang over and out.